So October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I'm going to talk about it because I have some work experience. I've been working with domestic violence survivors for about the last two years. About the last year and a half, I've been working at a shelter as a therapist for domestic violence survivors. So I'm just going to give a little background of how I first came into domestic violence. It probably I probably was about eight years old watching The Burning Bed. Now, if you've never watched that movie with Fear of Fawcett, you need to watch it. I don't know why I was watching that movie about the age of eight, but every time it would come on, I would just be so fixated because I couldn't understand why she was standing in that, that, um, that relationship with that man, why everybody was encouraging her to stay and people weren't helping her. I, it wasn't, uh, I guess, laws in place to protect women back then, and I just couldn't get it. I used to watch it, and I used to love when she would set that bed on fire. I shouldn't say that on YouTube, but that's some real stuff right there. I would love it and like to stay watching that part. Like, yes, burn it all down. So anyway, and I was happy when she got off because that was just some crazy stuff she went through. And I was just a little girl and I couldn't really process that. But anyway, domestic violence, what is it? Growing up, I always thought domestic violence was just physical. Somebody hitting, pushing, and shoving. It's that, but now it's classified also as more. So it's also, uh, like I said, it can be the, the rape. It's also physical. I mean, the intimidation, giving somebody that look, making them think you're going to hit them, threatening to hit them, like hitting walls. Um, I had a client um, who had a guy who would just throw food over the, ho um, over the house, plates, di break dishes whenever he got mad. Also, um, people who commit domestic violence can threaten to use the kids against a person, for instance, trying to take custody, even if they don't care about the kids like that. Anything to get to annoy the person that they're abusing you know um and a lot of times with domestic violence it happens more to women yes it does happen to men but it's a very small percentage so most of my um my experience has also been with women i think it was only one male client since i've been working that um i had so i'm going to talk more about um men abusing women so, uh, yeah, so I've also had clients where when they would leave, then the husband or the boyfriend at that time would want to um, take, um, have custody of the kids, uh, get the um, Department of Children and Family Services involved. Sometimes the kids would even be taken from both parents uh, because, um, you know, the male might have uh, reported the mother or somebody else who knows the family could have reported them. Then the kids are placed in foster care. It's just really not a good situation um, overall. So there's also uh, some abusers use financial abuse where they take all the money from the woman, even if she is working because they don't want to give her a chance to try to stack some money so she can flee from the situation. Or if she's not working, they may only give her um, a small amount of allowance to ensure that she doesn't have enough money to leave. They may make her beg um, for money, put in her on an, um, an allowance just so she can't really go uh, anywhere. Also, emotional abuse can be used, whereas um, calling a person out of their names, bitch, ho, slut, um, also putting her down about her, ch about, about her ability as a parent. Oh, you're not a good parent. Uh, my mother is a better cook than you. So-and-so was a better lover than you. You're just horrible. You're ugly. You're fat. Nobody's going to want you. Saying different things like that to make her not feel good about herself. Just putting a lot of guilt on her. It can also be minimizing or blaming. Like, oh, yeah, um, I didn't really hit you, you know, that day. Um, and even though she's sitting there with a black eye. Or, oh, yeah, well, if I did hit you, it was because you deserved it. Um, you know, or like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Like, uh, I actually can't barely see, but he like, oh, it's not that bad. You can see out that right one real good. So, you know, you'll be okay. Also gaslighting, making, which is, um, making somebody th doubt their reality as if they're crazy. Like I had one client say that she would put her boots by the door and he would move them and be like, what's the matter with you? Are you losing your mind? You can't find. And she's like, I know I just put my boots there. Or moving the keys around the house. And then he's like, he know he the keys are in his pocket. Oh my goodness, did you, maybe you need some medicine. Are you in therapy? Something wrong with you? You know, all kind of crazy stuff um, like that can, can be going on. 
And so also, um, an abuser may use male privilege, like, um, you know, you deserve to be beat because I'm the man and you're the woman. You should be subservient to me and stick around for this verbal abuse or mental abuse. And sometimes you'll even see a re religious people um, who will, re religious abusers who pretend to love God, but beat their woman, even though the Bible says that the man should love the woman as Christ loved the church. And Christ ain't never um, beat, beat his love church. Um, he was beating the people in the synagogue, but those weren't his people though. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, um, and also the Bible tells the man to love the woman as the man will love his own body and nobody ever per really does anything that's going to hurt their, like hurting their body. Like I'm not going to get a lighter and just start burning myself. I mean, maybe if I was you know, psychotic or something. But other than that, I'm just not going to try to just burn my skin and just buy my, myself. And you, you know, you're not going to do that. So people can use the Bible and women who don't know the Bible like that for themselves or are listening to other church members who are uh, misinterpreting the Bible feel that maybe it's their obligation to stay in these relationships. So they're conflicted like, oh, do I love God so I shouldn't leave him? But really, like, it, sometimes we make stuff too big and it's just using our our knowledge. Like, really, would God want me staying with somebody who could possibly kill me? N no. Uh, so there's the answer there. But there you go. So there's a lot of, of abuse. And just because a person is an abuser doesn't mean that they have all these characteristics doesn't mean that they use financial abuse doesn't mean they use the children like relaying messages go tell your mother i said this tell your mother this and that you know they may have some of these traits but not all and some abusers may have all of these traits it just depends on the person but regarding the kids i have seen also where clients will say that the man has told the kid oh you don't have to respect women you don't have to respect your mother your mother's a dumb bitch you, you don't have to listen to her so the kid whereas they were um listening to the, the mother now feels that they um it's okay to disrespect the mother so that's the mess of violence let me know your comments uh in the um in in, in the comment section what you believe the mess of violence to be then there's also the cycle of abuse with domestic violence. For instance, there can be that calm time where the couple, they're getting along well. They're watching movies that they both like. They're going out for drinks, whatever they like to do. They're doing it. He's maybe buying her flowers. She's giving him a massage. Everything is good. But then there's always some type of tension, like the walking around, creeping on eggshells, like you know, whereas the person would normally be happy if you pop them some popcorn or something, but then now you pop it and you know it's not burned, but now they're saying it's burnt. Or normally you may go make this person some fried tofu and they usually like the way you do the fried tofu and the grapeseed oil, but then now all of a sudden they don't like it. They want it fried in coconut oil instead of grapeseed oil, but you just like, but yesterday it was cool with, with the grape, with the other oil, but now you want this kind of oil. And so now you're like, okay, something's not right here. It's that crazy making kind of system or cycle. And then you go into the part where the violence comes and the violence, again, remember, it doesn't just have to be physical, but it can be physical. That emotional abuse can, can come about, financial abuse. They could be stealing your money, you know, or telling you, oh, I'm going to take the car. And then they just never come back for like three days. You know, some type of abuse is always going to happen or they're calling you bitch um, this and this and calling you out your name and you just can never do nothing right. Something's going to happen, you know. And then what happens, the next part of that cycle is the honeymoon phase where it's like maybe the apologies come or like, oh, I didn't mean it. You just get me so angry and so passionate by you and all this kind of stuff. You know, you just make me jealous. You know, the person is jealous anyway, you know, but they're like, you just made me do it. And then it goes back to that cycle, goes back again. There's the calm, there's the makeup time. Everything is good. We're buying the gifts and everything, you know, everything is just peaceful. And then it always goes back, because since it's a cycle, it goes back to that tension, walking on eggshells. A person is losing their temper just a little bit. Then it goes back to the violence. Then the honeymoon stage, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Then back around. So unless somebody breaks that cycle of dysfunction, it's always going to be a cycle. And it just came to my memory that I did forget using isolation can be um, 
something that abusers use, meaning that they don't uh, may not want you to be around your friends, your family so much, and um, they want to keep you to themselves. They're jealous, like, oh my God, you're around that friend. What is the purpose of you being around that friend? Are you trying to get with that person? You sleeping with that person, and the abuser may be cheating on you, but then they telling you accusing you of cheating because it's just projection they really doing it so now they feel for like oh my god i'm such a scumbag she must be a scumbag too i just know she just not you know um being good and decent so then um they accusing you and all and everything about that um all the forms of abuse i found you can find um just google the uh, domestic violence wheel and at the center of all these forms of abuse physical emotional uh, sexual, financial, intimidation, using kids, the using isolation. It's all about power and control. The abuser wants power and control over the person that they're abusing. You know, so I, a lot of times I'll see clients and they're like, but why did he say this to me? Why did he do, why did he um, take my children and get them thrown into foster care? He's never um, even wanted to be around the kids. Now all of a sudden he wants custody and got all these people in my business in the course. And now we're going back and forth and we both can lose the kids. Why, why, why? Because of power and control. He knows that that's what you love, so that's what he's going after. Or a woman may say to me, why is he calling me out my name? You know, why did he steal my money? Why did he hit me? Why did he do this? Why, why, why? Because of power and control. So the answer is always going to be because of power and control. And sometimes when people, when women are still stuck in their trauma and they're not like healed from it yet, they will keep coming up with reason after reason. And I can keep saying because of power and control. And it's like, and then they'll give me another scenario, but why this? And because whatever you tell me, it's always going to be the reason is because of power and control because that's what the abuser is you know in order to be an abuser and to get that high that they get from abusing they need to have someone that's subservient someone who is going to stay around for the abuse because that's the only way a person can be an abuser if they got somebody that's going to be there for it and to um allow them to abuse because if a if everybody leave them, they can't have nobody to, you, to abuse. And for them, in their mind, that wouldn't be fun. You have to have somebody who's going to be there to abuse. It's like roles in a drama or a movie, you know, a play. You know, everybody plays their role. And for the abuser, they've chosen to take the role of that power, the one who has that control, and they're looking for someone that they can victimize, you know. So um, they're both, like, playing their parts in this kind of toxic um, unhealthy sick type of way if that makes any sense um, again I don't know what I'm saying again I don't know if I said this but um, with abuse it can happen to people um, of any race any socioeconomic background it's not just a poor um, person's thing it's not just a rich person thing it's not just a black white Asian Hispanic it can happen to anyone um, because of where I live in um, California the majority of my clients just happen to be Hispanic because there is a large Hispanic population. But we get people who um, come in who are here, immigrants from Russia, all types of uh, different places. Uh, and also domestic violence is, has increased since COVID. You know, people have been stressed. And um, because of that, the numbers have gone up. You know, if a person is an abuser already and then, uh, you know, then having to deal with maybe losing their job or possibly losing the job, then the, that violence just goes up. Um, my experience, um, I've also answered the phones at our agency sometimes over the hotlines, and I get a lot of women calling in distress, don't know what to do. They don't know if there is help available. So my, my um, and there's so many people with children, they're looking for shelter and they can't understand, why don't you have a place? Why do you have to give me another number? And the sad thing is, is because people are calling constantly, night and day, looking for domestic violence shelters. And it's not just a, enough places always um, to accommodate everyone that's in need. But there is help. What can you do? If you're in that situation and you do have money, excuse me, allergies, if you do have money, it's to save your money, you know, as much as you can. So when you flee, you will have some type of money. Also making sure if possible, if you have a bag that you can keep prepared with some clothes in it um, that he won't find. Or also keeping your ID 
uh, social security cards, uh, driver's license, birth certificates, because if you're going to start over with a new life and get some type of housing, those are things that um, your case managers that you will possibly be assigned if you go to a shelter will ask you for those things. So trying to have those things together. Also, um, the things that the resources that are available to you, uh, if you go into, um, you, we call it 211 here, which is a, a information line. And you can call and ask if there's um, domestic violence shelters available and I uh, ask what will it take for you to get into those type of shelters, you know? And you can also, most of those are, are at least where I'm at in California, they accommodate singles as well, but they also, and men and women can go into shelters. And they, um, it just depends for what, what men you have to ask um, if they accept men in that particular shelter. But there's also help for men if you're going through domestic violence, but there is help available. Usually with the shelters are pretty, really good. There are rules, but you know, it, it just comes with the territory of staying um, in a shelter. But you can, can have access to a therapist. Like I said, I actually work on the site. So the women who live at the shelter, even though it's a short term for some people, a longer term stay for others, I am the therapist. If they want it, it's not mandatory. So I provide therapy to um, the, the single women, children, so, and also I do family therapy. I provide groups. On, um, there's groups available on life skills, cooking, cleaning, how to get ready for um, a job, how to prepare your resume, things of that nature. I do domestic violence classes. Um, I also do baking with um, a lot of my clients because I love to do it and then they like to do it as well. I offer children's groups where we talk about um, all type, all type of things. We, we try to keep it more fun based. I do teen groups and then there's also parenting groups. So there's a lot of resources. The case managers are really good about trying to connect people to um, housing. Sometimes other people may um, um, go into shelter, permanent housing, helping them get a job, helping them go back to school, helping them with legal care because a lot of people who come in are fighting the abusers over the kids and trying to get legal custody. Uh, child Protective Services Department, Child Family Services are involved, so it's a lot of, that goes into that. So you can get the help that you need from um, the shelters. Sometimes you may have to wait to go into the shelters, but there is help available. Even if you're not wanting to go into a shelter at this moment, you can still call like your local um, information line, 211, whatever it is where you stay, and ask about the steps it'll take when you are ready. And sometimes you can even get mental health referrals, legal referrals, even if you decide not to go into the shelter, they can still give you that. Uh, some other things, and um, stick around with me. So I can give you this information. So um, with domestic violence, what I've seen, it, it's not just random. Um, even though it can help happen to anybody of any socioeconomic status or race, there are some things that people who've been abused have in common. Uh, what I've learned through research and also what I've seen in my two years of working with people. For instance, um, the majority of the clients that I see have come from um, abusive childhoods meaning they probably were raped or molested in childhood or they had parents that um were in domestic violence situations like their mother was getting beat and stayed and then in turn had depression anxiety and took that out on the kids you um in, in some cases but a lot of it is the parents um either there was um um, emotionally abusive parents and this could be the mother too and then now the um, kids grow up and they're in these domestic violence relationships even when I have some clients start off telling me oh no my, my my family life was great it was this and this and you know over time you know I let it go and we talk about other stuff and it always comes back up that something was there was some type of abuse in that, in that family, you know, and they just were trying not to talk about it and were scared that they would make their family look, look their parents look bad, which is understandable in our culture. But the, it's, it's always something. When I tell you, it's always trauma in these, in these women's background. They didn't, they didn't grow up in healthy um, back, um, environments, you know. And even if their parents weren't married or living together, like mom would still have like some abusive boyfriend, something like that, you know. And then 
something else that I um, have seen um, the women that have gone through the domestic violence, not all, but it's a, a good enough number, is drugs. You know, I'll uh, have women coming in saying, well, I don't know why he hit me, why he treated me this way. And I started asking questions about him, her background and drugs are involved. And I'm saying, I'm not saying that it makes it right that he hit her because of the drugs, but when you're on drugs, you do all kind of crazy stuff. And even a woman was probably doing some stuff. So it turned out maybe she was hitting him too. Maybe she was selling her body. All kind of stuff was going on. People respond differently when they're on drugs. So maybe he was using drugs and he became violent. Maybe he wasn't violent before the drugs. But when he took the drugs, he did. So it's like we got to address the elephant in the room. So we can't just say, oh, why he do this? Why he do this? Y'all both were on drugs and y'all both were doing some stuff that y'all don't really want to address but we can't play no blame game really when both of y'all was on drugs and that's just the way i i look at it because drugs and alcohol abuse plays a big part in this you know of uh when people get to telling me their background um with the domestic violence i've also seen a lot of women with low self-esteem you know they're like They'll tell me, well, my self-esteem was good. I felt great of myself, you know, before him, and he destroyed me. He destroyed me. He destroyed me. But when I get to ask him more questions, even before about before that relation started with that man, that person's self-esteem was destroyed before then. That's been my experience, you know. Also, some of the consequences of the domestic violence that I see with these women, they come in the shelter, um, with, most of them with no money. Uh, a lot of them come in, they were already on welfare, coming in already on low-paying jobs or not having any jobs whatsoever. Uh, also, um, these women have, a lot of them have developed post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know? It's not just something that soldiers get, you know, they come in, they have a lot of fear, easily startled, anger, um, having flashbacks.